friends, it's the 21st of May today. And if you've been a part of this community for a while, uh, we have something to celebrate today that a year ago on the 22nd, we had a night of worship and it was also Carrie's first official day on staff at Branches. So she's been here a year. Let's go, Carrie. And in honor of that, she's gonna preach the sermon today. <laughs> it was offered, but she knew today's theme was less of ourselves. She was like, I just possibly couldn't, you know, I gotta, don't wanna do it today. So we're grateful for Carrie uh, and just grateful for her ministry with us. And as we continue in this series, we are gonna hear a word from, from Matthew's gospel today. And so, um, hmm? Matthew? is it in Matthew? John, one of those, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Thank you. We're so glad that you're here on Staff at Branches. <laughs> Where would I be? I'd be at Matthew, likely. Uh, so hear this from, from Matthew's gospel. This is John, geez. And that's why you're still up here, it was providential. From you, to you, through you are all things. Glory, hallelujah, amen. John's gospel. Jeez Louise, let's see if we can get through this today. Uh, John 3, starting in verse 25, says this. Now a discussion about purification arose between John's disciples and a Jew. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you, Jesus, across the Jordan, to whom you testified, here he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, no one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. And John the Baptist says this, he must increase but I must decrease. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, as we uh, continue in this series, I give you a, another opportunity to check in and let us know that you uh, were here today uh, so we can kind of let you know what's going on in the life of Branches and uh, connect you to other ministries and especially over the summer, give you opportunities to connect when things get a little looser during the season and just to let us know that you were here so we can connect you and, and, and thank you for being here today. Um, as you do that, just kind of want to be a little self-effacing to share a little bit that, uh, you know, I have kind of three people in my life uh, that know me better than anybody. Uh, first and foremost, my wife uh, knows me better uh, and in a deeper way than anybody else in my life. And we share everything with one another and she knows things about me that nobody else knows and um, that's part of what binds us together so closely in our relationship is, is that sharing with one another. She knows, she knows me and I know her. Uh, and second would be I'm a twin, I have a twin sister and so like, you know, lockstep for our entire lives. Uh, we grew up together in the same stage of life, uh, went through the awkwardness of middle school together and loved each other and hated each other and loved each other and hated each other and uh, we've grown together in that and so she knows me pretty well. And the, the third place would be my friend Paul. We went to college together and then he became a pastor and I became a pastor and then I moved to Houston and he was a pastor in Houston and uh, we ran together and really close friends and I hate to tell Paul this, but he's, he's dropped out of the top three. <laughs> the new one, I'm ashamed to say it, is TikTok. Uh, <laughs> it, learned, it just learns you so well, it knows you. When you need to have your little time of scrolling, it's like, here, you're gonna like this. And you're like, TikTok, you're right. I did like that. That was funny and informative. Uh, and so it's like, here's another recipe you'll save and never make. Uh, and uh, here is a list of movies you can add to the ever-growing list you're never gonna watch. And here's something funny that you think is very funny that your wife, who knows you really well, knows why you think it's funny, but she does not think it's funny. Um, for a while, it thought I was an ex-Mormon. Uh, but it learned, and it's getting to know me a little better. Uh, this week, uh, it's showing me clips of the new Zelda game, and you're like, wow, you and my 12-year-old son have something in common. And we do. <laughs> you know? uh, I'm scrolling through it, and it knows me, and it starts to learn you. And we know now, and China knows too, uh, that as you scroll through, and if you engage even a little bit in something, if you maybe watch it a couple of times, or send it to a friend, or hit the like button, TikTok inside is like, ah, they like this. <laughs> Let's show them more of that. We'll show them more, more and more of that. And so if you like a recipe, 
the next few are gonna be recipes. Or if you like some kind of offbeat humor, the next ones are gonna be like that. If you like something political, and, and so my, my phone knows me so well on TikTok. And, and it feels so good to be like, this is just for me. This is just for me. But occasionally within the algorithm, because it really, really wants to know you, every facet of your life, your, the things you really enjoy, the things you're interested in, maybe even what your profession is, and also your guilty pleasures or things that like, oh, I really like this, but I don't want anybody to know that I like it. And the other day, I got sucked down a rabbit hole because it showed me a clip of Dr. Phil. I would never choose to watch Dr. Phil, I would say. But that day, I was like, oh, wow. I got to see more of that. It was just part one, and there were like six parts of this one segment. And I watched all of them. <laughs> and it was an older episode of Dr. Phil, too. You know, it's like every week, it's like, what show is Colin going to talk about? <laughs> Today, it's Dr. Phil. Uh, and uh, this story was this woman in Canada. She had dated this guy, and uh, she said he, he left her, but she said that he told her he was going to come back in a limousine and uh, have all these flowers. But then she kept thinking that she would see him places, and then she'd be driving in her car and a song would come on the radio and she had convinced herself that he had programmed her radio to play these songs to send her secret messages. She was convinced that her brother and her best friend were keeping this man from her, that she was supposed to like figure out these puzzles. She would drive around the town and, and see like a man in a car gesturing to her in another car and think it was some sign from her boyfriend who had left her. She would drive along and see a man a distance away and think it was him and go chase after him, and then he'd disappear. It was a secret thing that he was doing. Uh, she drove, she lived in Canada. She drove all the way from Canada to Mexico, uh, thinking that he had sent her a message that she, he was in Mexico, and she swears that she saw him there. Um, you already guessed. He left, and on purpose, he didn't want anything to do with her. Uh, but she had convinced herself that that he was looking for her and wanted her to look for him. And Dr. Phil had determined with some medical expertise after he publicly shamed her on television uh, that there was actually this medicine she was taking for her rheumatoid arthritis, and it's a common side effect that if on this medicine there's a the psychological side effect might be that you start to make these self-referential connections that you'd like see a sign on the side of the road and read it and think it's about you. Or in this woman's case, you'd hear a song on the radio and think, oh, this must be a message for me. And every interaction and every piece of data and every experience she had would start to point, it's all about me, it's all about me. And Dr. Phil said to her in his Dr. Phil way, um, have you ever thought you may just not be that important? <laughs> and it's wild because I looked into this and it's a real thing, this medication taps into something that we all feel and just turns it up all the way that we think stuff is about us. And I think we've all had this experience one time or another, and it starts to go away as you get older and you mature, but it happens from time to time that you walk into a room and you see some people you know, and they all look at you, and then maybe one of them laughs, and you're like, oh no, is my hair wrong? or is my fly unzipped, or did I do something wrong? Are they talking about me? Are they gossiping about me? And you start to think, it's about me. It's about me, they're thinking about me, they're talking about me. Or you see somebody post like a video or a meme or a comic or song lyrics on their Facebook, or it's like an X or something, and you're like, they're thinking about me, you know? <laughs> this is about me. And you could probably guess, it's probably not about you, but this, this, this medication this woman was taking was amplifying that. And so I, when I was reading about it, I started to like feel for her a little bit. Not that I've ever had that intense of a feeling, but I do know that feeling. Like, and it's kind of a selfish feeling, if we're honest about it, that, oh, this interaction, those words, that message, whatever else, is about me. And it's, it's two forces butting heads with each other. One is this virtue that every culture around the world, every religion and ideology, at least verbally, lifts up as good, which is humility. C.S. Lewis defined humility as, it's not um, thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And so we lift up humility as this good, virtuous thing, and that's butting heads with, coming just in close contact and in just shaking up our experience because we live in a world that wants to make it about us. That's like the heart of advertising, is like this is you, and this is what you lack, and this is what you need, so buy it. So it's like humility is a virtue, but also 
you're really important. <laughs> and those two things can't really coexist, at least not for long, because you're always battling. Either you're going to be a humble person and ignore the environment around you to say, like, okay, it's really not about me, and then you're going to just kind of, like, squash yourself and flatten out your uh, personality or who you really are, or you're going to really embrace it and be like, you know what? The world does revolve around me. I really am that important, and everything is about me, and every road begins and ends with me. Those are narcissists. Uh, we know them, <laughs> and everything is about them. And so we want to we uh, detach from both of those. We don't want to squash ourselves and diminish ourselves, and we also don't want to prop ourselves up in a way that's like, okay, everything is about me. And of course, Scripture gives us a lot of messages about what humility is. And John the Baptist, I think, is a perfect example of humility. I think about uh, somebody that really uh, exemplified humility in my life that I think about all the time when I think about what it means to be humble. His name was Joe Short. He was a congregate in my church in Arkansas, uh, and he had cancer that eventually did take his life. And every uh, Holy Week and during Lent, on that Wednesday, it was tradition at this church in Arkansas to have a healing service. So the pastors would anoint people with oil and then ask them what they wanted to be prayed for, and then we would pray over them for healing. And part of this Christian tradition that believes that God can and does heal people. And it was actually kind of a new experience for me. It was really formative for me in my ministry and how I pray with and for people. And Joe had just gotten this diagnosis not that long ago. And so I see him in the crowd for this healing service, and he comes forward to where I'm standing at the altar. And as I asked everyone, I asked Joe, what do you need prayer for? And in my mind, I had already completed the sentence. He was going to say, for my cancer diagnosis. And Joe knelt down at the altar and said, I just want to be a good man. And humble. And it wasn't making about himself, though he still pray for his cancer diagnosis, of course, that he wasn't thinking about that. He was thinking about something more, something deeper. John the Baptist points to Jesus, points away from himself. And of course, what I'm reminded of is actually this, this painting. It's actually an altarpiece by a German painter, Matthias Grunewald, and I couldn't fit it all in there and also didn't want to put the entire crucifixion scene in there, but you can see this really beautiful altarpiece uh, from the 1500s. Uh, Jesus uh, being crucified in the center and different scenes from the Holy Week story and some saints on the side and uh, Jesus' mother there watching and then John the Baptist. And we can zoom in a little bit on John the Baptist here. Um, and there he is in his Dora the Explorer haircut. Uh, and I mean, it's bad, but he was in the desert. I mean, he didn't have a good barber or whatever, cut him some slack, eating bugs or whatever. And uh, then there's a, a, a lamb here, the symbol of the, the lamb that, uh, of God that takes away the sin of the world. And there's you know, some blood pouring into the cup at his feet and carrying this cross, the symbol of Christ. And then John the Baptist, this, this weird, anatomically incorrect long finger, pointing. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's long, it's weird. Uh, and behind him, some Latin text, which is translated from the text that we read today. He, Jesus, must increase, and I must decrease. This altarpiece, I'm gonna leave it hanging up there for a minute, uh, hung above Karl Barth's desk. Karl Barth was a theologian, Swiss theologian, and he said it was his project to do what John the Baptist was doing, pointing away from himself and to Jesus with these words, he must increase, Jesus must increase, I must decrease. I think the church uh, maybe has taken these words of John the Baptist as a call, as a, as a way of living, and I think it's a good way of living if, if, if apprehended and held correctly, but it's also done a really poor job in some way too. That maybe you've been presented with the Christian religion this way, is for a, a pastor or a preacher or another Christian friend to say, well really the central message of Christianity is you're garbage, <laughs> you're nothing, and Jesus is everything. And while there may be a kernel of truth to that. Uh, one, it's not very nice. <laughs> and two, it's not the whole story. Not actually, I don't think, what John the Baptist is trying to say with he must increase, I must decrease. Uh, when I was going to summer camp as a kid, I used to go to Camp Ozark, and when this whole thing, other, I know other Christian summer camps do this, FIT, uh, the acronym first is third. So 
God first, others second, yourself third. So it's kind of like prioritizing your life. It was actually a really good exercise for children to be like, okay, what are your priorities? It helps them be good adults too. Think of what are, how are you organizing your life? All of these things are good, but what order are they in? But it was always this tricky thing because the, when they would talk about it and they'd always have a talk about fit, first as third every year, they'd say, and then if you put yourself third, you're really first. Like if you put yourself at the bottom, that's like a good thing and you'll be lifted up. But then as soon as you think about like, oh, I'm really, I've done a great job. I put, my, I put God first, other second, and myself third, and that means I'm really first. You missed it. <laughs> and you go, know, okay, okay, sorry, God. You're first, others second, including people I don't like, and then myself third, which feels really good because secretly, God, I know you know. <laughs> I'm first with you, me, God, first, you know? And so it's this tricky thing. And I, so that's another facet of it. This is like, like, like propping yourself up. So again, it's that, the two sides of the spectrum. You're garbage, you need Jesus, he's everything. Or, hey, if you put it in the right order, you win. And I don't think that's what it is either. I think the only way we can truly understand what John the Baptist meant when he said, he must increase, uh, I must decrease, is to look at the lives of people who lived it out, to look at the lives of people uh, who emulated uh, how they lived after someone like John the Baptist, who was ultimately executed because he pointed away from himself and pointed to Jesus. John Lewis, who I've mentioned before, uh, walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, and it was because of his deep faith in who Jesus was and what Jesus' impact of his message was that all people are created equal and deserve equal rights under the law and deserve justice in this country, knew that he faced abuse, and knew that he faced possible violence, walked across the bridge anyway, because Jesus must increase, and if it meant his own physical well-being threatened, he must decrease, John Lewis must decrease. Or someone we've mentioned a lot here recently, Mother Teresa, who would dig through boxes of donated shoes and take the worst ones for herself and give the best ones to the people in the house for the destitute and dying because he must increase, Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Martin Lloyd who was a pastor uh, in England, who was the doctor for the royal family, was from a high-class family, and then was faced with, with his patients, the reality of death, and then for the rest of his life in preaching, he never told stories about himself, never talked about Dr. Phil or Love is Blind or anything like that, and pointed away from himself uh, and pointed away from his royal family connection because Jesus must increase and he must decrease. Or Stanley Rother, uh, who is a Catholic priest uh, from Oklahoma uh, and actually a kind of a failure, uh, did horrible in seminary, uh, was kind of moved around a lot of places and then was sent away near Lake Atitlan in Guatemala to be the parish priest for the indigenous people there and learned their language, translated the New Testament and the mass into the indigenous people's language, and then under threat of the oppressive Guatemalan government, still protected them and saved them and ended up martyred because he protected these indigenous people who were abused and used by the Guatemalan government. And he, he must increase, Jesus must increase, even if it meant Stanley Rother must decrease. It was moved by people's faith who embodied that image of John the Baptist saying, I'm, I'm not nothing, but Jesus is more than something. Jesus changes everything. Jesus makes everything I worry about and everything I care about matter because of who he is. And, and Jesus being increased, Jesus being lifted up doesn't diminish me but it's just properly understanding where he's at and where I'm at and that, that I have the, the gift, I have the opportunity, I have, I have the means, I have the way to connect my life to that. He must increase and I must decrease. Some of you may have seen uh, this week, uh, over this past weekend actually, that Tim Keller, a uh, famous Christian author, probably one of the greatest Christian minds of the past 50 years, passed away Friday morning. Um, and I've learned so much from Tim Keller. I had friends that listened to him in seminary and I didn't really catch on until much later when I realized like his preaching uh, moved me in a way that no one else's did. And though we were in different streams of Christianity, uh, I've learned so much from him. And I just wanna share uh, 
This is from his son, uh, Michael, who shared on Thursday night that his dad had come from, the ho- from home from the hospital, was on hospice at home. Uh, and it says this. As a health update, today dad, Tim Keller, is being discharged from the hospital to receive hospice care at home. Over the past few days, he has asked us to pray with him often. He expressed many times through prayer his desire to go home to be with Jesus. His family is very sad because we all wanted more time, but we know he has very little at this point. In prayer, he said two nights ago, I'm thankful for all the people who've prayed for me over the years. I'm thankful for my family that loves me. I'm thankful for the time God has given me, but I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus. Send me home. Then Friday morning, this is from Michael Keller too. Timothy J. Keller, husband, father, grandfather, mentor, friend, pastor, and scholar, all of these things, this is a huge accomplishment of raising this incredible family, this organization that wasn't about him, but about the message of the gospel, died this morning at home. Dad waited until he was alone with my mom, Kathy Keller. She kissed him on the forehead, and he breathed his last breath. We take comfort in some of his last words. There is no downside for me leaving. Not in the slightest. Because he must increase, and we must decrease. And, and just from my heart as the pastor here to yours, that, it, that it's central to what Branches believes what our task is in the world. So we remember what Jesus said, that I'm the vine and you are the branches. Jesus says, I am, I'm the center point of this plant, this beautiful growth that God has planted, and you're a branch on it. And as I grow, as I am lifted up, you grow, and you are lifted up. As I increase, your value isn't diminished, but because your value is attached to mine, you see who you really are, beloved, child, loved, brother, sister. And as many things as you accomplish, and accomplish so many things in this world, as much fruit as you plant and see grow in the world, Jesus must increase. That's our task. So we have this crossover here, and we read John's gospel that Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. That our task in coming to the table, our task in preaching, our task in in sharing with one another and praying with one another and singing with one another is to lift up Jesus. Not that he needs our help, but that others can see him. That we live lives of pointing, of turning the attention away from ourselves, not to diminish ourselves, but to say, look at that. Look what I've found. Look what I've experienced. Look at this person who in being lifted up wasn't enthroned with a shiny crown in a way that all kings are, but was enthroned by giving himself for others. The way Jesus increased was by pouring himself out, by actually physically decreasing himself on our behalf. And that's the most glorious, beautiful thing any person could ever do for another person. And that's what it means to increase. That's what it means to to have glory, to be holy, to be beautiful, to share love, to become a person of love, love, which is is the ultimate goal. So my, my charge to you, my encouragement to you, my hope for all of us as a community is that without diminishing ourselves, without taking that wrong road of teaching the gospel as beginning with your garbage and you have to be better and not turning to like, oh, I follow Jesus, I'm a really important person, to set all that aside, and to with John the Baptist, and with Martin Lloyd-Jones, and with Mother Teresa, and with Stanley Gother, and, 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 and with Tim Keller, with our lives, with our very being, with our words, even with our death, decrease so Jesus can increase. It's a gift, an opportunity for us to do, individually as families, in our workplaces, and in our church, and our community of branches. Uh, I listen to Tim Keller's sermons a lot, and they post his sermons weekly and just in the backlog, and it's, it's meant so much to me formatively, but for as many 45 to an hour sermons I've listened to of his, many of them, I'm always moved by one thing, and it's the same thing every week, that somebody else, another voice on that is narrating uh, what the purpose of Gospel in Life, his organization was. And it's this, it says, uh, we, we want you to give and, and, and share the content from Gospel in Life because, as Tim Keller says, the gospel truly changes everything, every facet of your life. And it is that 
Jesus increases and we decrease, and that shows God's disposition, his posture toward the world. Love, attention, care, compassion. And we get to emulate it. Thanks be to God for that. Let's pray.